grateful that, um, that our guest today was able to make this work to be with us. It is so special. Uh, and let me say the words slowly again so we can all enjoy them. United States Senator Ted Cruz. I have had the privilege of knowing you probably about 10 years, uh, and many have heard the story, but I think it bears repeat, repeating why uh, this is such an extraordinary move for the state of Texas and for our country. When Obamacare was passed, and we thought at the time that we had won, I don't know if everyone remembers, but Scott Brown had won Ted Kennedy's seat in Massachusetts and Nancy Pelosi and Harry Reid have both said, healthcare is off the table, we're gonna move it forward, we're not gonna deal with it. And uh, the Texas Public Policy Foundation had actually led a multi-million dollar, multi-state effort to defeat Obamacare and to really to educate and articulate, and I think we were in about 13 states during that time, uh, to lead the way on why it was such a, such a bad thing for freedom and liberty and the future of our country. But as we all know, it did end up passing and um, the White House really moved it through. And so the next morning we all woke up and said, what do we, what do, we do now? I mean, this is at, against the will of the majority of the American people. It's going to destroy our healthcare system. It's going to, one sixth of the economy, destroy the economy. And it occurred to us at our organization that maybe it's time for a reawakening of the 10th Amendment. Maybe it's time that we start talking about how Washington can't fix itself, how the states and self-governance, the people, are going to be the ones to take our country back. And it also occurred to me that I didn't have quite the uh, depth of understanding of the Constitution. Uh, I did go to Texas A&M and I did study agriculture, so uh, I needed someone with a little bit more up here and, uh, and I thought, who is the very best person we could possibly, possibly talk to about leading this effort? And uh, it didn't take me more than about half of a second to call Ted Cruz. And I'm forever grateful for his help in launching our Center for Tenth Amendment Studies, for being alongside with our Mar Mario Loyola, our director, helping him through, I think, a couple of years of really setting the agenda and talking about this organization and Texas being the leader in the country on the importance of states' rights and self-governance in the Tenth Amendment. So when we say that United States Senator Ted Cruz is going to Washington, it is truly something that is very personal for us at the Texas Public Policy Foundation and something that I believe is going to be extraordinary for our country. As Theodore Roosevelt said, and I know everyone's heard this but it bears repeating, the credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, but who does actually strive to do the deeds, who knows great enthusiasm, the great devotions, who spends himself a worthy cause, and who, at the best, knows in the end the triumph of high achievement. We have a man who is now in the arena today, and we are so grateful for it. My friends, United States Senator Ted Cruz. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you so very, very much. Well, I've spent the last week up in D.C. trying to get settled into my new job. And I will tell you, it's great to be back in America. <laughs> it's a different place up there. On Thursday, we had the swearing in. I think my favorite memory of that is Vice President Joe Biden swore me in, and, and afterwards he, he leaned over and, and picked up our two-year-old, Catherine, and she promptly began screaming and crying at the top of her voice. I, I can't imagine where she got that from. And, and actually, to the vice president's credit, he, he had a very warm, he said, it's okay, it's a Democrat, but it's okay, uh, which, which, which I had a chuckle. 
I am so happy to be back with, with so many dear friends. This is a room of men and women that, that, that have been warriors for liberty for a long, long time. The Texas Public Policy Foundation is a jewel. It is hands down the preeminent free market state think tank in the country, bar none. You know, Brooke talked about when TPPF was founding its Center for Tenth Amendment Studies, and she called and, and asked me to, to play a role in helping lead that. And, you know, Brooke kind of, she's very persuasive, so she started sort of, okay, I've got 19 reasons why this would be great, and we can do this, and we can do that, and, and I will confess my response was a little Jerry Maguire. I just said, Brooke, you had me at hello. <laughs> because it combines two of my favorite things. Number one, the Tenth Amendment, uh, which, which I have been a, a student of and, and proponent of for, for practically my entire life. And number two, TPPF and the incredible job TPPF does with everything that y'all collectively lay your hands to. And so it was a great privilege to be formally associated with, uh, with TPPF as a senior fellow. Um, as a senior fellow, I drew a salary of zero dollars and zero cents. And, and you got every penny of value you paid for. <laughs> what I want to talk about briefly over lunch is three things. Number one, what happened in November? Number two, the path forward. And number three, the fact that Texas must lead the way. What happened? For anyone who is a fan of limited government, for anyone who is a fiscal conservative, an economic conservative, November 6, 2012, was an ugly, ugly day. Conservatives got clobbered. We got clobbered everywhere. We got clobbered in the presidential race. We got clobbered in Senate races all over the country. It was not pretty. Now, inevitably, there were voices in the media, gray beards that began explaining the answer. Is if only Republicans would moderate their views. If only they would become more like Democrats. What a wonderful world it would be. Unsurprisingly, I do not count myself among those voices. We did not lose. And, and listen, there are some conservatives I have heard some express, as, as former New York Mayor Ed Koch put it, the people have spoken. Now they must be punished. <laughs> I've heard some conservatives say, all right, to heck with them. If people want to vote to bankrupt the country, to heck with them. I think that's completely wrong also. I think that's the wrong diagnosis of the problem. This election was not a popular affirmation of out-of-control spending and deficits and debt and regulation and job-killing policies from Washington. In fact, 53% of voters on election day when asked said government in Washington is doing too much and more should be done by the private sector. So what happened? What happened is simple. Margaret Thatcher famously said, first you win the argument, then you win the vote. Republicans didn't either. We didn't win the argument. Also on election day, over 50% of the voters said our dismal economy is George W. Bush's fault. Now why did they say that? It wasn't complicated. President Obama said that every single day of the campaign. And Republicans were so terrified of uttering the words George W. Bush that we didn't even bother to contest it. You don't win an argument, you don't show up. At the end of the day, the argument that was at issue in politics, that's at issue in the Texas legislature, that is at issue with TPPF, is what's the right path forward? What is the path that benefits, 
Americans, that improves our daily life. And I think Republicans did a lousy job making the case that it was conservative policies. If you want to know what went wrong in this election, a lot has been written about demographic changes. A lot has been written, for example, about the Hispanic vote. And Republicans got clobbered in the Hispanic vote. Now, the media wants to focus exclusively on immigration. I think immigration is important. But let me tell you what I think was much, much more important with the Hispanic vote than immigration. It was 47%. In two words, if you want to sum up what was wrong with this election, it's the words 47%. Now let me be clear, I don't mean the comment that was made. Anybody you stick a TV camera in their face 24 hours a day for two years, they're going to say something in order. That's the simple condition of being human, and I don't mean a criticism of Mitt Romney, who I think is a good and decent man who campaigned very, very hard. The reason I think 47% summed up with what went wrong is it encapsulated the narrative of this election. The narrative of this election was the 47% who are dependent on government, we don't have to worry about it. That was the comment that was captured. Let me tell you something as a conservative. I cannot think of an idea more antithetical to what it is we believe than the notion that those 47% we don't have to worry about. That statement, that idea, that narrative buys in to the left's view of the world. In particular, that there is a fixed and static pie, that nothing changes. There are the haves and have-nots. And you know what? If that premise is right, then the left's argument that government should get in the business of redistributing from the haves and have not, if the pie ain't changing, that argument has tremendous force. What conservatives understand is it's all about changing the pie. And so what's the path forward? I'm going to suggest a very simple path forward that I think is the key to winning the argument. It's what I call opportunity conservative. Now, what does that mean? It means that conservatives should conceptualize and should articulate every domestic policy with a laser focus on easing the means of ascent up the economic ladder, on opportunity. That we should think about, we should talk about policy through a Rawlsian lens of what are those in the 47% that are striving to achieve the American dream. How does it impact them? The reason I'm a conservative is very simple. Conservative policies work. They improve people's lives. There has been no engine for prosperity, for opportunity, for economic advancement like the free market policies of the United States of America. None in the history of the world. You want to make a difference to people struggling to get ahead? Adopt policies like the state of Texas has done that encourage small businesses and entrepreneurs, that encourage economic liberty to thrive. Let me suggest an experiment to everyone. The next time you're watching television and a Republican politician and the topic of race or class comes up. Turn off the volume. Just watch their body language. Most Republicans believe we're wrong. Can, can, can we stop talking about that? Can we talk about capital gains taxes? I can talk about that. I cannot tell you how many times I have wanted to put my boot through the television set. <laughs> Watching Listen, the simplest conventional wisdom of politics is Republicans are the party of the rich, Democrats are the party of the poor. I'm going to suggest to you that that is categorically 180 degrees false. That the policies of the left have wreaked devastation 
on the working class, on the poor, on minorities, on those who they are ostensibly trying to help. And the greatest avenue for benefiting those climbing the economic ladder are conservative policies. A lot of people say, well, Republicans favor big business. Big business does just great with big government. Gigantic corporations have no hesitancy to jump in bed with big government and to hire armies of lobbyists. Just small businesses don't have lobbyists. They don't have anyone out there. And what happens inevitably is you see big business getting government to put regulatory barriers in place. Dodd-Frank, let's drive up the cost in financial services for everyone. Yeah, it'll drive all the smaller community banks out of business. But to the lobbyists in Washington, what's wrong with that? The policies, and, and by the way, look at any socialist country. In socialist countries, if you have the good fortune to be born into the landed aristocracy, the rich do just fine. In Paris, you could see wealthy families living very, very pleasant life. It just happened that it was their great-great-grandfather's wealth. What you don't see is new rich people. What you don't see is new entrepreneurs. What you don't see is someone starting a business in their garage to take on that corporate titan and to topple them. Creative destruction, as Schumpeter put it, is what generates the dynamism of our economy. It's why the United States is the economic powerhouse in the world. When you have government controlling more and more of the economy, what you do is you freeze everything in place. The big businesses that are there will stay there, in part because government puts so many barriers to entry for everyone else that there will be no one else that becomes a big business. The rich will keep theirs but there won't be any new ones. And who gets hurt the most? Those who get hurt the most are those at the bottom of the economic ladder. Barack Obama's policies have utterly failed the 47%. You know, under Barack Obama, Hispanic unemployment climbed to over 10%. African-American unemployment climbed to over 14%. Yet, when was the last time you heard Republicans talk about that? So many Republicans do not understand that we're right, that our policies work. They've been beaten into submission by all of those in the media and by the overall narrative that it seems we believe the falsehoods. <laughs> You know, I'll tell you, when I was standing last Thursday on the Senate floor, I couldn't help but thinking back to 1957. That was when my father fled Cuba and came to Texas here in Austin. He was 18, he couldn't speak English, he had $100 sewn into his underwear. And he was washing dishes, making 50 cents an hour right up at the top of it. If someone had come up to that 18-year-old kid and suggested to him, 55 years hence, your son will be sworn into office as a United States Senator representing the great state of Texas, that would have been utterly unimaginable. It would have been beyond his comprehension. And yet last Thursday, there was my father sitting in the gallery looking down as I rested my hand on the family Bible and took the oath of office. You know, that was personally a powerful moment. But it's just one small manifestation of the incredible opportunity this country offers. The incredible ability for anyone to achieve anything. There has been no nation on the history of Earth that has allowed more people to come with nothing and achieve anything. And that fundamentally is what is being threatened right now by the fiscal and economic policies of Washington. 
by out of control spending, out of control debt, and regulatory <coughs> policies that are strangling small businesses. Now, why do small businesses matter? To be honest, they don't matter because of the small businesses. With all respect to the many small business owners in this room, they matter because of the opportunity. Two thirds of all new jobs in our economy come from small businesses. And when you have one regulation after another and higher taxes, all of that kills jobs and opportunity, which kills the entire dynamism of the economy. They also matter because small businesses are the best threat to big businesses. And I don't have anything against big corporations, as long as they're selling a better mousetrap. But I'll tell you, the very best dynamic in our economy for big businesses is to have small businesses chasing on their tails, putting competition on them. And that leads to the third and final point I want to say today, which is Texas must lead the way. Texas, well, the United States is a nation where all of us our parents, our grandparents. Every one of us here has a story just like my dad's. It's really quite extraordinary. Every one of us, we are the children of those who fled oppression and came here seeking freedom and opportunity. It's the most fundamental DNA, in my opinion, of what it means to be an American, to value freedom and opportunity more than anything else. And if you think of the history of the great state of Texas, where you had people living on the frontier, hard, difficult lives, Tennessee and Kentucky, you said, you know what, this isn't challenging enough. <laughs> so they'd stick on their door, GTT, gone to Texas. I mean, that is our state's heritage. It is our state's history. I like to describe the state of Texas as America on steroids. The freedom ethos is in our blood. The most basic ethos, what does it mean to be a Texan, is give me a horse and a gun and an open plane, and I'm conquer the world. That's what it means to be Texans. Now, right now, we are seeing a laboratory playing out. Texas is leading the way that it's possible to have limited spending, limited taxes, limited regulation. It's possible to have an environment that encourages entrepreneurs to go out and conquer the world. It's why we're seeing a thousand people a day move to our great state. Now, I have to admit, all of those who are moving east, who are coming from the formerly great state of California, I do kind of wish, in the world of border security, we had greater security on our western border. <laughs> and at a minimum, if you have people fleeing California or New York or Illinois, that they don't show up here and vote for the same knuckleheaded policies that destroyed their economy in the states they're fleeing. Let's be clear, we will welcome everyone, but it wouldn't be terrible to have a little examination on coming in. <laughs> Are taxes too high or too low? And if you say too low, please go back to your, your home state. And yet, you know, I, I say most of that for the, our friends in the media, most of that is tongue in cheek. But I say that also as a broader illustration of the point of winning the arguments. People don't necessarily connect the policies that we are enacting here in the state of Texas with the opportunity and the jobs and the material welfare that comes from them. You know, the most simple difference between left and right is both look at the economic left. And those on the left have the instinct of wanting to reach down, physically grab people, and move them up. And that is usually driven by noble desires to help people. 
The problem is it never, ever, ever works. The only way anybody has ever climbed the economic ladder is to pull himself or herself up one step at a time. And conservative policies have to focus on individual responsibility, on taking care of your family. Look, the great thing about Americans and Texans, not a one of us wants to be dependent on government. Every one of us wants to stand on our own feet, provide for our family, seek our way in the world. Those are the policies that work. I cannot tell you how many times I've said when my dad was an 18-year-old kid not speaking English, washing dishes without two nickels to rub together. Thank God some well-meaning liberal didn't come put his arm around <laughs> and say, let me take care of you. Let me give you a government check. Let me make you dependent on government. And by the way, don't bother to learn English. I'm going to respect your culture so much that I'm going to trap you out of the professional and educated classes in this country and keep you dependent politically on me. That would have been utterly and completely destructive. Those policies do not work. Now, I will say to the members of the Texas legislature who are here, thank you for your service. If I am successful in even a tiny respect in Washington, it is my hope to make your jobs much, much harder. <laughs> A cynical friend of mine once suggested the First Amendment should have ended after the fifth word. Congress shall make no law. <laughs> but Texas is right now a laboratory for demonstrating conservative policies that work, for demonstrating the incredible opportunity that allows people to work towards the American dream. I know there are a lot of challenges you're facing. I will tell you personally, let me encourage those of you in the legislature who are looking at reforms in our education system to increase competition, to empower parents and students, to increase choice. Few policies can have a greater impact on opportunity than helping free kids who are trapped in failing schools and helping by empowering them by creating competition. And by the way, I'll, I'll, I'll pick that as one example of what I mean by opportunity conservatives. The way to address those issues, the issues of choice, it ain't about the rich or middle class. That's not an issue that focuses on, listen, if you're living in Memorial in Houston, in one of those big fancy houses. If the public school there begins to have 50% dropout rates, if it has 70% illiteracy rates among those students who stay, if it has drug dealers walking the hallways, if it has little girls being assaulted in the bathrooms, Memorial High School would be empty in a day. The parents there, every one of them has choice. They have a checkbook in their pocket. And if the school starts failing their kids, they have the ability to either move, physically move to another location with a better school, or pull out their checkbook and write a check to another school. The rich and middle class have had school choice from time immemorial because they have the resources to demand that their kids be able to get a good education. What school choice is all about is giving the poor, giving those struggling without resources the same choices that the rich and middle class have always had. But that's how we've got to articulate, that's how we've got to think about the policy. I mean, imagine for a moment if you were a single mom living in the Fifth Ward of Houston working two jobs, struggling to provide for your kids, and your only option was a school that presented very little hope and opportunity, 
for your kids. Imagine the hopelessness, the frustration you would feel. What school choice is about is giving those kids the same choice and ability that the rest of us have. That is powerful. A friend of mine was litigating, defending the school choice program in Cleveland. She described one of her clients to me some time ago as a, about a six foot seven tall African American man who was a single dad who came up to her and he was crying because when the program was enacted there, immediately there was litigation challenging it. And this, this huge six foot seven man began weeping and saying, why won't they let me send my little girl to school? Why? This is about hope and opportunity, but we've got to understand and articulate and conceptualize it focused on exactly that. And that's true on every issue under the sun. I think conservatives should champion every day the 47%. We should champion every day the American dream. We should champion opportunity. And I look forward to working with each and every one of you going forward to do exactly that. Thank you and God bless you. is the next phase is the cross-examination period. <laughs> uh, speaking of the cross-examination, what I especially love is that you will be cross-examined by a former Californian refugee after saying all of those words about our friends from the West. If I could ask Chuck DeVore to come on up, our Vice President of Communications and Senior Fellow at Fisc uh, Fiscal Policy. Uh, many of you know Chuck. And I, Chuck, do you have one of your books on you? The Texas Public Policy Foundation just published a book called the Texas Model, Prosperity in the Lone Star State and Lessons for America. That's right. So it'll be available this week. Many of you will be receiving copies of it. We are very excited about it. Chuck wrote it. Uh, Chuck, of course, served almost half a million people in the California State Assembly uh, for a number of years. He was vice chair of the Assembly Committee on Revenue and Taxation in California. He also ran for the United States Senate in California for Senator Boxer's seat. Is that correct, Chuck? So we were very grateful. There are some good things, Senator Cruz, coming from California. Uh, and one of them- Many good things. Many good things. One of them at the top of the list is uh, Chuck DeVore, who joined our organization over a year, about a year and a half ago, and has been an extraordinary addition to our team as he fights for freedom in Texas. So please help me welcome Chuck. And gentlemen, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Well, Senator Cruz, uh, actually, I think that now that I'm in Texas, you should build the border fence to the west, <laughs> so, just to make that clear. Uh, a few days ago, you made some news when you referenced the uh, shutdown, as it was colloquially called, back in 1995. You said something akin to, this was the last time we had a degree of fiscal discipline in America. Could you elaborate a bit on what you were talking about in, in that statement? Sure. We've got many problems in Washington, not least of which is we have a culture in Washington that just cannot stop spending money. And, and spending is truly out of control. Our deficits are out of control. Our debt's out of control. Uh, to, to put it in perspective, the, the magnitude of the problem, when Barack Obama was elected president, the federal government expenditures were roughly 20% of GDP. They're now nearly 25%. That's a fundamental structural shift in the size and role of the federal government. And unsurprisingly, that's, that shift has had a direct consequence on our deficits and debt. When Barack Obama was elected, the national debt was roughly $10 trillion. It is now $16.5 trillion. It is now larger than our entire GDP, our entire economy. Now, unfortunately, Washington has proven utterly incapable of restraining spending in any meaningful way. 
And that problem, I fear, has only been exacerbated by the results of this last election, by a president who is feeling, it seems, quite untouchable right now, and a majority leader in Harry Reid that is convinced that they have a mandate to barrel down this road of yet more spending and deficits and debt and even higher taxes. So what is one to do as an economic conservative in the U.S. Senate? And the answer can't be drink heavily. <laughs> the only hope, I think, in the near term, between now and 2014, the only hope of getting anything resembling some serious policies to turn around the fiscal and economic crisis that has happened is to use the few leverage points we have to extract concessions from the other side because they will not do so willingly. Now, you, look, you can look at the last, the fiscal cliff deal. How many folks remember back in the presidential debate? Let's shift back to the 432 Republican presidential debates we had. How many of you remember the question that, that the news media asked, would you support $1 in tax increases for $10 in spending increases? Who would not support that? And everyone raises their hand. And all of the media shakes their head, oh, those narrow-minded, obstinate Philistines. You know, this fiscal cliff deal shows why that's such a trap question. So this deal had $620 billion in tax increases, all of which will kill jobs, hurt small businesses, and will hurt every American, particularly those at the bottom of the economic ladder who are trying to get new jobs. Those taxes are going to take, take many of those jobs away. But Presumably, it was an exchange for something. Using the, the media's famous 10 to 1, that would mean that $620 billion was, was linked with $6 trillion in spending cuts. Instead, the deal had zero in spending cuts and, in fact, increased spending by $330 billion. That's Washington math. We're bankrupting our kids, and their answer is to spend yet more money and dig the hole even deeper. The only hope of changing that, as I said, is to use leverage weapons. And so, in my view, conservatives in Congress should use every leverage point we have, whether it's the debt ceiling, whether it's continual, uh, continuing resolutions, to extract the maximum policies, number one, structural changes to address our out-of-control spending and deficits and debt, and number two, pro-growth policies to get the economy growing again, which is the number one most important piece to turning things around. Could you address, uh, just for a moment, the mechanical challenge, though? Back in 1995, we had both the Speaker of the House and the Majority Leader in your body, the U.S. Senate. Now, of course, we only have the Speaker of the House and if you recall from 1995, uh, Speaker Gingrich, who will be at policy orientation later this week, will tell you that, that President Clinton kind of won that encounter because there's 535 members of Congress, uh, 100 senators and 435 members of the House, and only one president who speaks with one voice. So how do you anticipate that battle going where the president has the bully pulpit and can say, it's you, Senator Cruz, who are preventing these Social Security checks from getting to these needy people. Um, that is a challenge, and let me address that in, in several pieces. Uh, number one, the most basic dynamic in divided government is whoever owns the default has the advantage. With divided government, either side can stop whatever's happening. The reason we got such a lousy deal with the fiscal cliff is Barack Obama owned the default. If Congress did nothing, the result was a massive tax increase on every taxpayer in America, which he was perfectly happy to have happen. I think President Obama was serene to go off the fiscal cliff 
because the outcome was the substantive policy outcome he wanted, which was to raise taxes on Americans to pay for this massive expansion in government spending. If you flip to the other side, to either the debt ceiling or the continuing resolution, I think both of those are the mirror image of the fiscal cliff. Because fiscal conservatives, if we stand together, we own the default. Let's take the debt ceiling, which will be the first of these leverage points we have. The debt ceiling, now it's important to note, the last time the debt ceiling was an issue, President Obama killed Republicans in messaging. Uh, flying down to Austin this morning, the fellow sitting next to me in the plane said, please, whatever you do, don't fight on the debt ceiling because I don't, I, I don't want a financial meltdown. And we had, shall we say, a lively discussion over breakfast on the plane. Let me be abundantly clear. The debt ceiling debate has zero, absolutely nothing to do with defaulting on the U.S. debt. Let me explain why. Federal tax revenues are approximately $200 billion a month. Interest on the debt is between $30 and $40 billion a month. There is more than sufficient federal revenue to meet our debt obligations every single month. The only people in Washington who are threatening default on the debt are named Barack Obama and Harry Reid. Now there's a reason. You know, there's an old phrase that, that is talked about in Washington. They're called Washington Monument Games. Washington Monument Games get their name from the following hypothetical. Congress asks the Department of Interior, if you had to cut your budget by one half of one percent, what would you cut? And the answer that comes from the Interior Department is, we'd have to shut down the Washington Monument. <laughs> If you cut a penny from our budget, that's what we take. And you pick the thing that makes people scream with horror and say, I'm sorry, that's what's on the chopping block. <laughs> Barack Obama is playing Washington Monument games with the debt ceiling. Let me tell you what any responsible president would say. He would stand at the podium and he would say, under no circumstances will the United States of America ever default on its debt. Period. The end. We will meet our debt payment obligations regardless of what happens with the debt ceiling. And I'll point out, this is not hypothetical. Two years ago, Senator Pat Toomey introduced legislation that said in the event the debt ceiling is not raised, the United States will not default on its debt and will always meet its interest obligations. What happened? Harry Reid immediately killed it. said, no, we're not voting on that. Why? Because we want to scare the American people that those crazy conservatives want to default on the debt and bring in a financial apocalypse. Now, there's a word for that. That's called demagoguery. But last time we got killed because we were not effective making the case, making the argument. And what is the effect of not raising the debt ceiling? Forty cents of every dollar the federal government spends, roughly, is borrowed. You can't borrow anymore. It means there is a partial, temporary government shutdown. Essentially, 40% of federal expenditures go away because you can't charge any new debts. We've seen that before. We saw that in 1995. Now, what happened in 1995? We didn't default on the debt. What did happen was a couple of things. Number one, there was some political pain. But number two, as a result of fiscal conservatives standing together, we saw year after year of balanced budgets from the U.S. Congress. And some of the greatest period of fiscal responsibility Congress has had in modern times. That's if we stand together. Now, if fiscal conservatives do that, we will be excoriated by the media, we will be excoriated by the president, by Harry Reid, by everyone who says, please, please, please keep the spending train going. But if we actually behave like we have a semblance of a backbone and actually believe we would like not to bankrupt our kids and grandkids, then I think we have the ability to extract significant material improvements, not necessarily fix everything, 
but significant material improvements to limit the out-of-control spending and to adopt pro-growth policies to get the economy going. Well, Senator Cruz, I am uh, absolutely are my senator and not uh, two previous individuals whose name mentioned who are now your colleagues. You have to now deal with them uh, in the U.S. Senate. Uh, I, I feel like I'm a survivor from the Titanic, and uh, I'm very, very relieved and very blessed to be in the great state of Texas. And ladies and gentlemen, I think that you can all agree that the state of Texas is greatly blessed to have Ted Cruz as its junior senator. Thank you, Chuck, and God bless you all.